And so we'll go ahead and get started. So, hello and welcome to the Power Hour webinar series. Power Hour is a monthly professional development and learning opportunity for staff of Georgia Public Libraries. This series will feature subject experts sharing tips and best practices related to a variety of topics impacting our libraries, such as library partnerships, information literacy, and facilities management. These sessions are free and made available to all library staff throughout the state of Georgia. My name is Dorcas Davis, Director of Continuing Education and Training, and I'll be your host and presenter for this session, which features the importance of empathy in the customer service experience. This event is supported through the funding of the Georgia Public Library Service and Library Services and Technology Act through the Institution of Museum and Library Services. Before we get started, I have a few things to share with you. This session will be recorded and archived and made available on the Georgia Learning Center and on GPLS's YouTube channel one week after the live recording. If you are attending this live webinar, the CE certificate will be emailed to the address during that you use during the WebEx registration, 48 hours following the completion of the webinar. So please check your spam folder. If there are other people watching this webinar with you, please have someone to record their names to keep a record of everyone, and we'll get, make sure that they receive their CE certificate as well. You will also have an opportunity to submit text questions for our pre for well, for me. Um, so please type those in the Q and A panel. That will make sure that I won't miss anyone. So now we will go ahead and get started. Once again, I'm Dorcas Davis. Director of the Continuing Education and Training for the Georgia Public Library Service. I've had the pleasure of working in a variety of libraries since 2005, and I've come across many library characters as well as I've worked alongside colleagues with very unique personalities, and I may be one of them. Um, I am in no way an expert on the topic of empathy. However, it is something that I've practiced along the years, and doing so allows me to be very patient with others and an approachable person. And these are important skills to have when working with the public every day, as well as being a representative of the library. In this webinar, we will clearly define what empathy is, why it's important in the workplace. And after viewing this webinar, it is my hope that you will have a better understanding of how to practice empathy when dealing with library patrons who aren't always so nice. If you would, please take a moment to read the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary, Dictionary's um, definition of empathy, which it says it is the power of projecting one's personality into the object of contemplation. By definition, empathy is the ability to sense and understand, as well as share the feelings of another person. We might say we're putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. That's always heard. I've, I grew up hearing that phrase. Definitely makes sense. Empathy, however, should not be confused with sympathy. I've included a short definition of sympathy on the slide. And sympathy is more about feeling bad for someone as opposed to being empathetic. Empathetic just means that we can see where that person is coming from.
in my search to find things related to empathy, I came across a really um, great video. It's fun, and I'm sure um, you you all have um, experienced life hacker in some shape, form, or fashion since being on the internet. But I wanted to share this video with you all because I thought that um, it's a very, uh, very, very good resource on empathy, in my opinion. And they explain it very perfectly. So I'll get started here. The importance of empathy. We all live in our own version of reality reality that is limited by our senses, our temperament, and our own experiences. It is the only reality we will ever truly know, but it is crucial to our personal development, our relationships, and to society itself that we make the effort to try and experience other people's realities as well. This is done through empathy. Simply stated, empathy is an active attempt to understand another person's perspective, their emotions, and in essence, their reality. We are social animals, and our ability to communicate and understand each other's emotional states is key to maintaining our relationships. So it is little wonder that the ability to empathize is hardwired directly into our brains. One area that assists in this process is the right supermarginal gyrus, which helps us to distinguish our own emotional state from that of another person, and plays a key role in our ability to observe and assess what other people are experiencing. Studies from Neuron Science Journal suggest that we have systems of mirror neurons in our brains that cause us to mimic the action of others. That is why when we see someone yawn, we will often yawn in reply. And when we observe someone experiencing joy or pain, we experience the same sensation to a certain extent. But these reactions are primarily driven by subconscious reflexes. In order to be truly empathic, you have to actively think beyond yourself and your own concerns. You can develop this empathic skill by practicing some simple habits. Be observant of others. We tend to spend the majority of our day dwelling on ourselves, caught up in our own daily routines and digital distractions. But taking the time to observe others around you is a good first step in developing your empathy. Watch and wonder. Try to focus on the person's state of being rather than categorizing or labeling them. Ask yourself, what kind of day are they having? How are they feeling? Challenge yourself to genuinely care about their well-being. Curiosity about others is the first step to expanding your empathy. Use active listening. During a conversation, especially a heated one, most people formulate the response before the other person even finishes their statement. This form of communication is more verbal combat than an exchange of ideas or opinions. Avoid this reflex by slowing down. Rather than rushing to reply, take a moment to consider the other person's statement. Ask follow-up questions to better understand what the speaker intended. Try to understand their emotional state and the deeper motivations behind the statement. What life experiences led them to their current worldview? Remember, you don't need to share someone's opinion in order to understand it and acknowledge it. And listening will help inform and expand your own opinion. Open up. Learning more about other people's experiences is a key element to seeing the world through someone else's eyes. But it is also important to open up about your own feelings and experiences. Empathy is a two-way street that at best is built upon mutual understanding. Through a combination of uncovering the deeper motivations of someone else's position and expressing our own underlying concerns, we often discover a shared commonality, even with those who hold different beliefs than ours. Through the practice of keeping an open mind, empathy helps us challenge prejudice, find commonality, and expand our moral universe. Without it, we are apt to label people outside our circle as the other, the problem, or the enemy. These labels draw lines in the sand that prevent us from moving forward or growing. It cuts us off from the realization that the human experience is a shared experience. We have much more in common than we think and are really just seeing small variations of the same reality. I do apologize. Some of you all could hear the video, but then some of you could not um, could not access or could not hear. I'm not sure why. So that's something that I'll make sure I'll check with WebEx so that future webinars we won't have this problem. But for those of you who could not hear the webinar, I um, included the link in the chat area, and I'll make sure I do it again. It's down below in the chat area, and, um, and I'll also make sure that I include the link to the um, video after, um, well, once I send out your CE um, certificate.
So thank you all for your feedback on that situation. But I do apologize again for you all, the ones who could not hear the, the audio. So um, we'll move forward. <clears throat> I wanted to have a discussion about um, empathy. Do you know that during an interaction with a library patron, your actions do or don't display empathy? Um, I have an example. Um, rolling your eyes. That's not empathetic <laughs> at all. So how can you be empathetic with a lady who can't remember how to print or make copies, even though you've shown her how to do it a hundred times this month? Rolling your eyes or blowing hot air is not the answer. Let's think about it this way. We all have someone in our lives that's 10 steps behind on technology, and they always need help. My person is my dad, and I hope he's not listening. Um, after many long years, he's still trying to connect his email to his Wi-Fi. It can't be done, but he doesn't understand that. Um, and if I'm not available to help him, I want someone else to be as patient and as kind to him as I would however many times he asks for help. And he's going to ask, has there been any situations like that that anybody would like to share? We have someone typing. Yay, okay, so Kimberly shared that, not a situation that she can think of, but she thought of a possible tip to help. Maybe we can pretend that this is a new patron <laughs> whom we haven't helped before. It might make us more patient with that person. I definitely um, agree with that. And she also, she thinks she's uh, my dad. Jill says that she likes to imagine her grandparents or her mother, and she wouldn't want anyone to treat them with disrespect. <laughs> and she and another Jill says that she does that with the copier all the time. Um, here's another one. How can you be empathetic with the obnoxiously rude teenager who treats you like the dumbest person and talks mean to you and the other library workers? Now, I want you to remember when you were that age and you felt like the world was against you. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Maybe you were bullied. Maybe your parents were going through a divorce. As the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. Teenagers eventually come around, especially with consistent kindness and safe places to go. You did. I did. The library was always my place of refuge. Can anyone share an experience that they've had with, with teenagers or young adults, as we like to call them, in the library? Tamara says um, she remembers what it was like to be a teen and to remember that they're not addressing you as a person. I like that. Donna says that she addressed them as people. So I think I have a, a group of empathetic um, participants. And before I move on, I want to share Jill's um, response. And she says that we have a woman who is really rude and obnoxious at times. Then she came in with her husband one day, and he was rude and obnoxious to her. Suddenly I understood why she acted so miserable all the time. You got really great insight into that lady's life. And you all probably 
were more tender hearted when dealing with her afterwards. That's great. So we'll move on from this and thank you all for sharing. As public service workers, I know that I may have made a few of you all feel guilty from the last slide, um, but I do know that dealing with the public is hard. Library workers, we easily become overwhelmed with day-to-day -day activities, especially because no one told us that we would have to be social workers. They didn't tell us we had to be school teachers, counselors. They didn't tell us we had to be lawyers babysitters, interpreters, and the list goes on. Also, many library employees fall along an introverted scale of personality assessment. For an example, um, people who are introverted, we tend to be overstimulated by a lot of interactions. For the introverted personality type, Milford and Wazowski pointed out, excess customer transactions can be overstimulating. Don't we know it? Developing relationships with customers requires us to have strong social skills and to be able to shift from being the reserved information professional um, into a fellow information searcher along as a and as well as a potential friend. I know that's a stretch, but these are people that we interact with every day, um, interact with every day. So, And relationship building has a lot to do with key factors of, of empathy and, and listening. So I would like to know, are there any introverts? <laughs> Just say yes, because I am one. And I think being um, a library or public service worker helped to um, move me from um, being in inside introvert to uh, to the point to where I can actually deal with dealing with the public, and um, hopefully, as we move along, I can show you all or tell you um, different coping mechanisms. Lots of introverts. Okay, I think the um, the system is going to crash from the introverts responding. <laughs> Shannon says, says that, yes, she is one, but she can cope. So like I said, um, relationship building has a lot to do with key factors of empathy and listening. So I want to move on to empathetic listening or empathic listening. Um, I use those terms interchangeably, so um, don't get confused. <sighs> What is empathetic listening? Empathetic listening, also called active listening, is a way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding and trust. I really like um, the, the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and I actually follow um, the author on LinkedIn, and he gives tidbits every day. So check check him out. I'm sure he has an Instagram page and a Facebook page. So follow along, um, and he gives really good um, information, even on um, emotional intelligence as well. And he says that empathetic empath, empathic listening is not listening until you understand. Instead, it's listening until the other person feels understood. And um, I think that's really that's really important because sometimes when we listen, when we listen, we listen to give a response and we may have just missed the point. And I'm backtracking here. We had one person to say that they're not an introvert. Linda. Linda lead the way. <laughs> lead the way for us introverts. Um so I found this really great slide. I also uh, follow this teacher. I don't know if you can see at the bottom here. Um, you can look her up, RLJ 1981. Um, but she's a teacher. She's so funny, and she's great. 
and she's very successful. And I think that is because she practiced active listening with her students. Um, if you all look at the at the slide, she talks about paying attention. Look at who is talking. And for me, looking at that person without rolling my eyes has definitely been um, something that I had to learn. But I think I got over that as a teenager, <laughs> especially if it's something that I'm not interested in. That's just part of being an introvert. Um, ask questions. Asking those questions. Um, I take that to mean to ask questions. So what I'm hearing from you is um, how do you think I can help you or how can I help you? Those are really good questions. And visualize what is being said, and that's definitely a part of um, being empathetic to what the, the person is telling you. And here again, I just wanted to list out um, our characteristics. So let me move back to active listening. Um, also on crisisprevention.com, I wanted to share that with you, but I'm afraid the audio is not going to work. But I'll make sure that I share the link with you all afterwards. But um, they added more tips on em empathic um, listening. One is to be non-judgmental, and that's not always easy, but letting go of your own opinion, it frees up you to focus on the other person's perspective. Acknowledging a person's views and emotions help you to help them. And that's what we're there for. That's why we're. Um, that's why we are public service workers. We're there to help. Um, that's our main goal, and we want to let people know that we care. Um, next is we want to give that person our undivided attention, and that's also in the chart. Um, giving people our full focus, it displays respect, and the person is more likely to stay calm when they feel respected. And that's definitely um, important to remember in, a, in the heat of a mo in, in the heat of the moment. Um, listen carefully to feelings and, and facts. Soak in those words and um, notice the tone of voice and the body language and the other clues that go that go beyond the words and gain insight to emotion. So, um, you know, a, a good response would be, I can tell or I can see that you're really upset. That just confirms and validates that person's feelings, and people love to be validated. I do. Um, show that you're listening. Think about your posture again. Don't slump down and give that big sigh and, oh, here we go again, um, type of body language. You want to display supportive body language. Give that eye contact. Give a nod. And um, lastly, restate and rephrase, paraphrase what, what they're saying. So, um, if you speak, refer to that person's words, ask questions, um, clarify comments. So just repeat. This works for me, repeating the, the last phrase that the person says. Um, that lets them know that, yeah, I, I was really listening to them because I repeated exactly what you said. Does anyone have anything to add on active listening? Is there something that I may have missed?
Karen states that 80% of communication comes in the form of body language. That's true. If I see someone that's tensed up, or most people who see someone that's tensed up, they're not going to want to, to deal with you. And I often look at, um, at my children when they were younger. They could tell children are very intuitive and, and because they, can, they also pay attention to everything that you do. So they can tell when you're tense. Um, they can tell when you're tired. They may not care, <laughs> but they know. Um, Jill says that sometimes I interrupt if I think I know what they want, and that's a bad habit. It's good. Knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe, Jill. Um, and, again, it goes to, to we tend to listen to um, – to give a reply as opposed to understanding. So, you know, you have to practice that silence. So we're going to go back to the characteristics. As public service workers, we um, relationship building, it has to do a lot with, the, with empathy and listening. So we want to develop relationships with our customers. And we have to have strong social skills and be able to to do that shift that I spoke about earlier. And you know, unfortunately, as introverts and those of us who um, are working on our social anxieties, our personal discomfort can definitely cause a breakdown in empathic uh, listening and dialogue. But practice makes perfect. But um, that brings us to, to our next slide, which is barriers to empathetic listening. Poor listening skills definitely make a huge negative impact. So, Geo um, interrupting, that's definitely a, a sign of, of poor listening skills. And that's, listening skills is something that we all have to develop. Barriers to emphatic listening include behaviors that can interfere, interfere with the communication process. See, we have someone who wants to share. And I do apologize. I can't get to everyone, but you all are so um, interactive. And I like to share what you're saying. She says, my library system had a staff undergo serving population with challenges training. And I would say that my customer service skills has been enhanced due to this training, and I'm more empathetic and understanding when helping customers considered um, helping customers who are considered challenging. I think that's great. I want to move on to um, barriers to active listening. Becoming defensive, hey, I've been guilty of that. I've been so guilty guilty of that. But that's um, part of practicing empathy and um, practicing being an active listener. When you are in the midst of defending yourself, you cannot hear what the other person is saying. It's just impossible. Um, because you experience a sort of tunnel vision and your reasoning is off. Like, everything the other person is saying becomes an attack. And when you're in the heat of the moment, you know, everyone loses, everyone loses focus and it becomes unproductive. Would anyone like to share how they um, deal with patrons in the heat of the moment? And Karen, you're definitely right. Karen says that um, it's also important with coworkers and managers. We do have to be um, more empathetic with each other. I'll give just a second if someone wants to share. Now we'll move on. 
Another barrier is blaming the person, implying that it's the patron's fault. Okay. While this may be self-satisfying, it doesn't do anything to diffuse the anger that the customer is feeling. And it may even escalate the, the situation. And I try to think of how I feel in that situation in, in on the when the shoe is on the other foot. When you're blaming someone else, basically you're saying, oh, you're so unknowledgeable, you're not smart, you just don't know what you're doing. And no one wants to feel that way. No one wants to feel less than. And that's what blaming someone um, can do. Cynthia says that she had a patient become defensive toward her because she's not she could not understand part of her language. And she became angry, saying, I was speaking English, not Japanese. That was very, um, that was very, that was mean. <laughs> that was very mean. And when I was in situations like that, which we all, I think you cannot, unless you live in Mayberry, you're not going to be able to get away from it. Um, one one thing to do is to remove yourself. If you have to, if you get to that point to where you're so angry, you're seeing red. You can always remove yourself, get a coworker to come in and um, take over um, for, with that patron uh, for you. Karen says that, you know, say you understand how they feel and even apologize to them to give them reassurance. I think apologizing um, definitely helps, and just being patient with the with the people. Even if we a language barrier, Atlanta in in the surrounding areas, Georgia period has become such a melting pot, and um, we have so many um, resources that that can help us with those language barriers. And it may take us a moment to 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 get to them, but. You know, just assuring that person that we do have um, ways to help you and so that you and I can better understand each other. I think that that reassurance would definitely um, stop a lot of um, misunderstandings or stop a lot of uh, of anger that the patron may feel. And here is, I'll share another one. Jennifer, she said that she had an issue with a researcher who was angry because their materials, which need 24 hours to be retrieved, she works in the archives, they weren't in just yet. But she requested them by the end of Friday, and the weekend doesn't count as that 24 hours. She started to blame her basically saying, well, you should have put the um, request in on Thursday. <laughs> but all she did was, um, all that would have done was make her very angry and defensive. Oh, you did do that. Wait a minute. She said, I'm sorry. She said she told her, well, you should have put them in, put the request in on Thursday. But all it did was make her make, made her feel very angry and defensive, and she should have ha should have handled it differently. Well, you did know. We all get caught up in the heat of the moment, so don't beat yourself up for that, um, Jennifer. We've all done that. You know, like I said, blaming the other person is definitely self satisfying, but this is not the best way to go. And, you know, the bigger picture is we want them we want our patrons to keep coming back and we want them to bring their children and their children to bring their children. We want lifelong learners. But, you know, maybe next time you see her, just apologize and you know, and, and give her the policies. Um, give the policies to her and let her know again. So don't beat yourself up for that. Um, here's another one. Downplaying the person's anger. And this one has been known to set me off personally. <laughs> I've witnessed this and I've experienced this on so many unfair, um, just an unfair share in my life. 
and here 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 it goes. Ma'am, I'm gonna need you to calm down. Calm down. So, you know, just imagine yourself when you're angry. Do you want someone to tell you to calm down or stop being angry? No. That only adds fuel to the fire. So never downplay what that person is feeling. You know, and 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 it's different when a person is being physical. But I think being um when a person a person becoming so angry that they're physical in the library, I think that those instances are few and far between and we can normally um de escalate situations by just listening and letting people get their feelings out and sharing them. Our other drill shared that um, when she needed a prescription filled and it didn't get filled as promised, she had the nurse tell her, might I suggest taking care of your refills earlier? <laughs> that did not make her happy. Karen also says to validate their feelings. Say that you know that you're truly upset, but I'm here to help you. I think that's great. Amy adds, what about if someone is yelling and disrupting patrons? What should you say? Then that that's different from being um empathetic. There's a there there are policies put in place for people who are being disruptive in the library. So I want to move on to solutions. These solutions have personally been um, helpful to me. After patrons are allowed to vent, like I said, let them vent. Sometimes people just need to get it out. Um, after patrons are allowed to vent, they usually calm down, thus giving you a chance to work on solutions. And you want to make sure that you agree on the problem, and you can use those um, the, the questions so you feel like this. This is what happened. Um, use those open dialogue questions. And um, you want to make sure that you have some ideas on how to resolve the issues, which knowing your library's policies and procedures will definitely help you with that. And if you don't know, always get someone else to come in um, and help you with that situation or explain um, a policy um, that can explain it. They may be able to explain it better than you can, or they may have more experience um, with a certain policy or procedure. But it's okay to ask for help. Number one, above all things, do not take things personally. Customers can be rude and downright nasty. It's, it's going to happen. It's inevitable when you're dealing with the public. Um, I found an article on MindTouch, and they gave a really important reminder. It said to remember that the customer is not angry with you. They are disappointed with the service or whatever the situation um, that may have happened. And you also want to keep in mind that you did not directly create this anger or frustration. But you can, however, influence its path. So you can definitely change the course of a bad situation. We do have that power as um, public service workers. And sometimes it's hard because some people are on medication. Some people are just, you know, um, just going through a lot of things and they just were easy targets. Um, next is distinguish your emotions. And I always say breathe. It's okay to breathe. Take that time to be silent while they're speaking and you breathe. That really, really helps. I know it's sim it sounds simple, but um, but breathing, 
through your nose and out of your mouth, that really helps in the heat of the moment. Because, again, you don't want to do anything to set people off, especially in in today's time. Um, again, don't make those snap decisions. Do a buddy check. I like to call them buddy checks. Have someone, um, another co coworker. I always like to get someone who's um, a little bit more experienced than myself to come in and, and explain um, a certain policy or um, or maybe they've had experience with that particular situation, whatever it may be, um, and can offer you insight or can offer a solution that you may not have thought of. It's okay to separate yourself. It's always okay because if you come off as rude, then you are representing the library, and how you represent the library will fall upon everyone else. Try harder to, to empathize. You know, um, I can't remember who said it, but pretend, <laughs> pretend to make up a situation that this person may be going through and you understand what they're going through. It's definitely okay. It's not against the law. You can do it. If that's going to help you get through that situation, by all means, do it. Let's figure out how to help these people or just de-escalate um, situation because we don't want to set them off and we do not want to cause um, pandemonium amongst the other library patrons. And we want to set boundaries. So, you know, and, and, and again, we have that power to do so. And do not let workplace distractions dictate your interactions with patrons. <sighs> Perfect example, the cell phone, and more and more library um, um, systems are developing cell phone policies. When um, I'm going to, if I'm at the, the store, I don't want the cashier on her cell phone, especially when she's dealing with my money. You know, so that's something to, to, to definitely think about. Um, and maybe your library system can develop the same policy for your patrons. Hey, I can't service you if you're on your cell phone because that 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 also helps to break down um, communication between people because you could be telling them some very important information or they could be telling you very important information but you can't hear because there is a third party on the on the cell phone. So and that's just one example. Does anyone have any any other solutions they'd like to share? We have another Jill. Hi, this is the day of Jill's. Um, she stated that she thinks most people don't want to ruin your day. They just want to be heard. I agree. Thanks for sharing that, Jill. Jennifer stated that she likes to be a partner in their solution. And she said, she gives this phrase, this is very frustrating. Let's try and figure this out. Yeah, I like the word let. That means that you both take an ownership to, to whatever is going on, and you're both going to work together to um, figure things out. Karen says, um, Please, re people remember how you make them feel, not what you did for them. Right. Cynthia states that her system, they have policies stated on the front door. Um, but as one of my coworkers states, they don't read. Who comes to the library to read? No one. No. <laughs> but that's when we just um, give a gentle reminder. Um, you know, while I'm servicing you or while you're here at the front desk, do you mind, you know, putting your cell phone away? 
so that I can speak to you about your speak with you about your account. And here we have another Jill. I love you, Jill. Um, I wait patiently. If someone is using their phone, then say, "I'll wait until you're ready." And that usually um, they usually get the hint from that. Okay, lastly, I want to um, encourage you all to, to practice. Practice makes perfect. Um, empathetic effort, it, it can be defined as the willingness to invest time or energy in feeling empathy. The ability to have empathy is important as a foundation for caring and compassion between and among people, and it contributes to positive relationships in all areas of life, whether it be at home, with our coworkers, um, between our managers, or the people that we manage, um, and most importantly, our customers who are our patrons. We are definitely capable of, of enhancing our empathy on a personal and an organizational level. So um, I really hope that this webinar serves as a catalyst to get everyone started. And with that, I'd like to um, conclude this month's Power Hour session. I want to thank you all again for attending this webinar. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email address listed on the screen here. And once you leave today's webinar, you will automatically be directed to a survey. Um, and if you do have problems with that survey, please let me know because I need to know what you uh, I need to know your your thoughts and I have to have your feedback so that I can know how to improve these webinars. And um, again, the CE certificates will be emailed to you using the email address that you use during the WebEx uh, registration um, within 48 hours following the completion of this webinar. So I want to thank everyone again, and be sure to attend next month's Power Hour webinar session. Goodbye.